Uh, we started serving because uh, there was a call to serve. And then we've stayed in hospitality because it enables the boys and I to feel as if we are really part of the church family. Well, here I've been doing this since I was nine. So I've, I've had a real sense of community. And it's just given me a family. Ever since I was nine, it's helped me grow up and mature. And I've learned so many things from these amazing people here. And it's helped me grow into the man I am today. It's fun. It's camaraderie. There's young people, there's people my age, there's people in between. It's love and joy and fellowship. And that's one of the reasons I've served in hospitality so long. It's family. It's a family. We are there for each other when things are going well, when things are not going well. Uh, we tease each other just like family. And you know that this family is a family that is going to love you no matter what's going on because their first priority is to show the love of God. And that means everything, that you know these people are looking out for your best interests at all times. community of God's people uh, show up here before the 8.30 service. You might not know this. There's a service at 8.30. There's another one after this. But about an hour and a half before the 8.30 a.m. service, that group is here, our hospitality team. It's about 50 to 70 people that are part of that whole ministry volunteering to serve us. Donuts and fresh fruit and all those different things. And, and, but they don't just serve. They have community together. They're, they're, they discovered that we is greater than me, that them being together, working together, Get things done that one person couldn't get done. And, and we're going to think about that a little bit today, but I want to think first about this menu uh, or recipe concept I talked about last week. I shared this picture last week, and I said that, that really, if you look at what it be, is to be more like Jesus, the Bible lays out lots of things, but there's seven primary kind of items, seven primary ingredients in our spiritual maturity and our spiritual growth. And they're marked up there with those, those seven different pictures. And sometimes we look at that as sort of like a, a menu. Oh, I'll pick the two or three that I like, instead of a recipe, that all those are needed to make us mature and help us be who we're meant to be. And it really is a recipe. Those are all the ingredients. And so starting up at 12 o'clock, right at the top there with the, the picture of the Bible and the little face there, that's, that, that's biblical engagement. Part of our spiritual growth is biblical engagement. And then you move over to passionate prayer. God speaking to us and us speaking to God. Then the hands with the heart being lifted up is, is wholehearted worship. And part of our spiritual maturity is worshiping God wholeheartedly. And then the, the hand helping the hand is humble service. We humbly serve people in the name of Jesus. That grows up, us up spiritually. And the hand with the heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Offering our resources and all that we have up to God. Joyful generosity. That's part of our spiritual journey and growth. The little roof of the three people is consistent community. We'll be looking at that today. What's it look like to consistently be in community with people in a way that we discover that we is greater than me? Consistent community. And then with the lighthouse and the light shining out, that's organic outreach, naturally sharing the love and the grace of Jesus. If you want to see how you're doing in those seven marks of spiritual growth and maturity, just go to our, the Shoreline app or to our website, and there's a self-assessment. You can do that assessment in about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and the minute you send it in, it gives you results back. It's just for you. Unless you click on the button that says, I'd like to meet with someone, then that'll come to, to Sherry and our spiritual formation department, and someone will call you about meeting with you and helping you design a plan for growing in Christian maturity. But what we're looking at today is kind of like at about 8.30 on the clock there, the little roof for the three people. We're talking today about consistent community. And consistent community is really understanding that God has made us to be connected to other people. And sometimes we think that, 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 that me is greater than we. I can take care of it myself. I can do it on my own. I think I, I, think I was kind of raised that way, that you, you can do anything. You can take care of it. Just do it on your own. And then I discovered when I got married that when you're in a good, healthy marriage relationship, we is greater than me. I became a better person, a stronger person because of my relationship with Sherry. In a good friendship, you discover that we is greater than me. In a church with God's people who are trying to follow Jesus, we discover that we is greater than me. It's not good to walk through life alone. We need to walk in community. And that's really what the Apostle Paul says 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read a couple of passages. They won't be on the screen behind me, but if you have your Bible, you can turn here or just listen to these words. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, in, 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 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, he talks about how the church is like a physical body that has lots of parts, but it's still one body. Here's what he says. Just as the body, the physical body, though one, has many parts, and all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. That's a picture of what it's like to walk in Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. If you've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you become part of one church, one body. And it's bigger than shoreline. It's Jesus' church all around the world. And then Paul uses the two most dramatically different groups in the world at that time. He says, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. These are two groups that were at odds with each other. But, but Paul says, but in the church, those big differences melt away because we're one in the church. We're the body of Christ. So we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And the Apostle Paul says that the church is not made up of one person, one part, one gifting, but many, many people. Then he goes on in, in verses 15 through 20 to say, don't ever say, I don't belong. I'm not needed. When it comes to the church, don't say, I don't, I don't matter. I'm not needed. Some of us have had situations in the church, experiences, how we view ourselves, pain in the inter interaction with somebody where we found ourselves stepping back and stepping back from community and from the church. I say, I'm not needed. He also goes on to say, don't ever say, you're not needed. Don't look at anybody else and say, you're not important, you're not needed. We are a body. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that means you have something to bring, something to offer, something to make the church stronger. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, what that means is when you do become a Christian, you will have something to bring to and offer in the life of the church. And then he finishes by talking about how when one member suffers, all suffer. When one member rejoices, all rejoice. And his point is that, that in our greatest sorrows, we sorrow with other people. In our greatest joys, we celebrate with other people because we're made for community. And, and so, so this idea that, that we is greater than me may not be pop, popular with some people in, in culture in ways, but God's very clear that we belong to each other and we need each other. And Jesus modeled this. Jesus loved people, and they loved him. You can't read the New Testament. You can't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus, and not realize how much Jesus loved people. And they loved him back. Jesus was all about community. But I want to share a hard reality as we begin thinking about this topic of consistent community, of we being greater than me. And it's simply this. Community in the church is a sharp two-edged sword. Community in the church, being in community in the church, and actually being in community and connecting with any people, it's always dangerous. But in the church particularly, here, here's the two edges of the sword. On the one hand, in the church among God's people, there is a connection, friendships, joy, partnership, care for each other that's more wonderful than anything you'll ever, ever experience. If you really engage in the life of the church, you're going to meet people who love you, who love Jesus. You're going to grow together and you're going to have wonderful relationships. But also in every single church, you're going to also bump into people who are hurtful and mean and difficult and you will experience pain. You will experience pain in being part of the church. You know why? Because there's people in the church. And we're, we're, being, we're becoming more and more like Jesus, but guess what? We're not there yet. And, and I always tell people, if you want to compare scars about being hurt in the church. I love this scene in the, in the very first Jaws movie where the guys are sitting there on the boat and they start talking about all their different scars. Oh, this is a, this is a thresher shark. And this is, oh, I got, and they're showing all their scars. I can compare scars. I'll tell you just one story. The very first church that I served in, I wasn't even a pastor yet. I was doing my master's work. I was an intern. I was working 40 hours a week, so I was working full-time for the church, being paid very, very modestly. And Sherry and I were broke. But we were just make, making it through and finding kind of month by month, just trying to make it through and kind of struggling. And so I went to the pastor of this church where I was an intern. He was my pastor. And I said, Pastor, Sherry and I are struggling. We're going behind every month, further behind. We can't afford, you know, she was working as a, at a, teaching at a small Christian school, but not making a lot of money. So we just had her income. I was working for the church, but it was just a tough time. And I said, so here's the deal. We're struggling. Is there any way the church could help us a little bit with our school costs? And is there any way that maybe the denomination that this church was connected with, do they have like a money or a fund or some way to help students 
of theology. People are planning, planning to go into full-time Christian ministry. And here's, here's the response to me. Hey, in times like this, you've got to learn to eat cold beans from the can. Okay. Not even allowed to heat them up, apparently. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't even pour them in a bowl. Um, and he let me know that he said, you know, he said, when I went through seminary, I struggled. This is the way it is. And he just gave me his little speech. And so... So I guess there's no money in the church. There's no money in the denomination. I'm, so we went through the year. The next year, I went back to him again. And I'm a persistent guy. So at the beginning of the year, I was looking at our finances. And I said, I said, Pastor, is there any way the church can help us? Or is there any way that the denomination has some money available to help out? And he said, hey, you just need to learn to eat cold beans from a can. And year three, same thing. At the end of the third year, and, and in year two, Sherry stopped teaching because she felt called to go to seminary and get her master's in theology. So we were both going to school, and we had only one income, which was the church income, which was very modest. So we were just kind of going backwards. So at the end of three years, I graduated, she graduated, and they asked me, would you be on the student supervision committee? Will you work with students of theology and kind of encourage these students that are still in seminary? I thought that'd be great. I'd love to serve that way. So I go to my very first meeting of the student supervision committee. And at the first meeting, they hand me the agenda. And on the agenda, there's all these different things. And one of the items was funds for students of theology from the Zion Fund. And so, I, I, so they said, okay, well, you know, they, they said these five students have written a note and appealed for funds. And they're all in full-time volunteer, volunteer full-time or paid full-time positions in churches. So they said, give a motion to give each of them $6,000 for the year to help with their students' costs for school. And then one person was part-time. We give a motion to give $3,000. All in favor, please say yes. They voted for it. After the meeting, I said... I said, man, I wish that this Zion you know, student fund was around the last three years when Sherry and I were in school because we didn't, couldn't get any money. And this guy said, well, that's been around for 20 years. So all you have to do is write a note like these people did. You'll, we'll give it to you. We would give it to you every year. And I said, is there any way that my pastor could have not known about this fund? And the chair of the committee said, well, no, he was the chair of the committee the last six years. And it... it it felt like I got punched in the stomach. Because here's what I realized. My pastor wanted us to suffer, wanted us to struggle. And we did. And I, and I said to this guy, his name was Kevin, the guy who was the new head of the committee, <clears throat> I said, is there any way you can go back and retroactively like, do it? And he went, he went, he actually said, I'll go and check. And they said, no, it would be precedent setting. We don't have enough funds. It's it. But he said, I'm really sorry. You, all you would have had to do is write a, a note. And we'd have given you the money. And at that moment, I realized something, that being part of the church is a sharp two-edged sword. And sometimes you're going to get cut, and sometimes it's going to hurt. And here's what happens oftentimes when we get hurt by someone in the church, by a pastor, by an elder, by a friend, a Christian who just doesn't behave very well. We do this. And we start sort of stepping back. If that's what the church is like, I don't need community. If that's what Christians are like, I don't even know. It, at that moment, I could have said, do I even want to be a pastor? Do I even want to go into ministry? I mean, is this, this is what... But, but what God put on my heart was this. There's so much good in community of the people in the church, and there's gonna be some people that are broken and hurting, even pastors sometimes, who are not perfect, who are gonna hurt you. Don't walk out of community because there's some harsh people in the church, or you'll never be in community because, there, because there's gonna be tough things you're gonna face. And as I was preparing this message, I really felt in my heart like, like God wants me to, to say, I, I know there's some people here today that you've just pulled back. You might come to church, but man, you get out of here as quick as you can. Or you might be watching online and say, I don't even go in the building anymore. I'll watch online, but I don't want to walk. In. I live you know, a block away, but I'm not going to come into the building because I've been hurt by someone. And I feel like God is saying there's some people that have stepped back from community that today God wants to say, take the chance, step into community. And like I said, I've had lots, I got lots of war wounds and scars from being hurt by people in the church. But there's way more blessings than there are pains in being part of the body of Christ. And I, and I can share with you also, in that exact same church, at that same time that was all going on, there was a couple of Walt and Patty and their daughter, Michelle. And Walt and Patty loved Sherry and I. They, they, they looked out for us. Sherry's family lived in Michigan. This was in Southern California. My folks, my folks lived down by the coast area in Southern California. We were kind of inland. And so we weren't near our family. And Walt and Patty became family for us. And they would, after like church, sometimes they say, hey, do you want to go out for lunch? And they always paid. At that, time, at that time in our lives, we each got $2.50 a week to do whatever we wanted with. That was our own money. And uh, we had $5 every two weeks or two fifty a week, and I didn't have to answer for that. I could spend that any way I wanted. That's how broke we were. And uh, so when they would say, can we take you out to lunch or dinner, it meant the world to us. 
They would take us out to frozen yogurt. This was like, it was kind of like a new thing, frozen yogurt. And it was like, we couldn't do that on our own. We just didn't have the money for it. And their daughter, Michelle, would babysit our firstborn son, and she didn't charge us. She just knew that we, she just served us that way. That's the church too, right? Great blessing and joy and community and some heartache and pain along the way. Will you step into community and take the risk? I think that's what God's calling us to do. And Jesus is the example of this. This year, we're talking about what it means to become more like Jesus. And so today, I want to think about how does Jesus show us that community matters? Let's look at Jesus and learn about community. So it starts here. Jesus exists eternally in perfect community in the Trinity. If you're a note taker, there's a place in your, outline, your bulletin if you want to write some notes down, if that helps you remember things. But Jesus exists eternally in perfect community. The theologians use the word Trinity. That's not a word in the Bible, but the word Trinity just describes the idea that the Bible teaches that God Almighty exists eternally in one being, God, but in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And God is in this perfect Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is eternally in community, and Jesus is part of that community. When Jesus, at the end of his life, after he's died on the cross and risen again, before he ascends to heaven, he's speaking to his followers, and he's telling them to go out and tell the world about how much he loves them and share the good news. And he says this in Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And listen to this baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's God's eternal community. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If we're becoming more like Jesus, we have to recognize Jesus exists eternally in perfect community. That's how important community is, that our God exists in community. And then, Jesus is all about relationship and community and calls us to the same. Jesus is all about relationship. He's all about community. Jesus could have stayed in the glory of heaven and never walked on this earth. But he came among us to walk with us, to give his life for us. And so Jesus is all about relationship and community and he calls us to the same. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. Jesus is asked, what matters most in all All that came before him, all that happened in God's word that came before Jesus, the the first two-thirds of the Bible, he's asked, what's the most important thing? And here's what Jesus says. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Jesus, the most important thing is this, community with God. Love God with all you are, your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength. Love God, community with God. But then he says, he says, this is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. She says, the second most important thing is this, community with people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, of all the things the Bible says, here's the two most important, community with God and community with other people. If we're gonna become more like Jesus, we listen to his words and understand being in community is the will and the desire of Jesus. For Sherry and I, we have an interesting experience that happens on a regular basis. We'll be out at dinner, out somewhere around town, and somebody will come up to us and they'll say, they'll say you know, uh, Kevin and Sherry, uh, we go to Shoreline Church. We, don't, I don't know, we, we haven't had a chance to meet you face to face yet but we want to introduce ourselves. We're really sorry we don't mean to bother you. And we always say, don't apologize. We love people. We love being in community. We don't, we don't, we're not, you know, we, we love to connect with people and when we get an interaction with them and get a name and a face put together, we love to get to know people better. But people will feel bad about bothering us. We're like, no, no, we love, you know, showing is a big church so we don't know, we can't hang out with everybody all the time, but man, we love to connect with people. This year, God called me to two things in my spiritual life that, I, that I've done in the past and that I love to do but he called me to not do them alone. He called me to community. One is I love to do Bible memory. And earlier in my, you know, when I was younger in faith, I did lots of memorizing big portions of the Bible, and I felt called this year to do that again. So, so I really, I picked a portion of the Bible I'm gonna, I'm gonna memorize, and I'm gonna commit to memory and make it in my heart and my mind. But then God put this on my heart. Don't do it alone. Invite people in the church to be part of that. So I mentioned this last week. I'll mention it again today. I'm starting probably the 1st of February with a group. Anybody who wants to commit to, to memorize in 2020 this year, Memorize one chapter of the Bible or more. It could be a psalm like Psalm 23. It could be a, you know, a, but if you want to commit to memorize a chapter of the Bible or more, I want to do it in community with you. 
So just my, my email address is on the bulletin. Send me a note and just say, uh, this is my name, this is my contact information. Let me know more about this Bible memory thing and I wanna know more about it. And I don't know if it's going to be five people or 50, but we're going to get together three or four times this year and just share what God's doing in our hearts as we're memorizing a big portion of the Bible and how it's shaping us and encouraging us and how God's working in our lives. I want to do that. I, I would, now, could I do that alone? Sure, that's what I've done my whole Christian life. But God said, here's what God said to me. He gave, God gave me all these little pushes, like, take a step in the community. <laughs> don't do it. You can do that alone, but don't. Do it with God's people. So those that want to jump in and do that with me, let me know. Send me a note. And also, I love to read. I'm always reading one, two, three different books. And God put on my heart, don't just read alone this year. So I'm starting a, a book club. I'm going to pick up about three or four books to read with anybody in the congregation that wants to do it. You can send me, again, send me an email and say, tell me more about the book club. And I'll put you on that list and let you know. And we're going to read some different books and meet and talk about them and learn from each other and be encouraged in our faith. Again, things I can do alone, but God's telling me, Kevin, be in, you know, God's pushing me to be more in community, to connect more with people. And, and I, I love doing that, but you get busy and you don't get around to it. And so God's been encouraging me in that part of my life. And then of all the people in history, the one who does not need community is Jesus, yet he sought it. I mean, of all the people who've walked on this earth, who doesn't need more community? Jesus. He's in an eternal community with the Father and the Spirit, right? He's God Almighty. This is what John says in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, starting the first verse, when John's describing Jesus, he uses the term the Logos, the Word, but he means Jesus. And it says, in the beginning was Jesus, the Word. And the word, Jesus, was with God, and the word was God. He's perfectly divine. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the divine light, the source of life. Does he really need another friend? <laughs> Does he need a community? Well, he doesn't, but he longed for it. He, connect, he loved people. If we want to be more like Jesus, we have to long for community just like our Savior did. And then Jesus called people to community with him. When Jesus walked on this earth, he called people. He didn't just say to people, okay, if you want to be a Christian, follow these five doctrines. Believe this, 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 you're in the club. What we believe is really important. But you know what he first called people to do? He said, follow me. Walk with me. Hang out with me. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, Jesus calls a guy named Matthew. And Matthew was a person who was, was an outsider. Uh, Matthew, Matthew was a person who, who the Jewish people would have despised because he was Jewish, but he would become a, he'd become a tax collector for the Romans. And he wasn't just collecting taxes for the Romans. He would always collect extra for himself. He'd become very wealthy. And so we read this in, in, in Matthew 4, 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to look first, first at, uh, uh, at Peter and John. I, I, we're going to look different. I had my mind a different passage. So he's calling, calling fishermen first. As Jesus was, call, was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And here's his words. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. So so. Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, and he says, here's what I want you to do. First of all, follow me. Have relationship with me. Have community with me. Then he says, then you're going to stop fishing for fish, not real relational, and fish for people. You're going to connect with people and share my love with people. And then Matthew comes next. Jesus loved being with the outcast and the excluded. And, and, and the warning here, I think what Jesus is saying to us is beware of the my kind of people mindset. You know, the my kind of people, I like, having community, I like having community, but only with my kind of people. People like me, who agree with me, and see the world the way I do, and people have something to offer me or make my life better. And so, so Jesus tells a story about Matthew, the tax collector. As Jesus went on from there, Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he said. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, look at this picture. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and with his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus goes on to say, a physician doesn't come 
for the healthy, a physician comes for the sick. And I'm the good physician. Jesus called people to follow him and walk with him, but Jesus also walked in relationship with people who were difficult people, challenging people, people who didn't see the world the way he did. And then Jesus also knew that people are broken and that they would hurt him, but he still lived in community. If anybody knew the frailties of human beings, if anybody knew our potential to hurt another person, it was Jesus. He made us, he knows us, he loves us. And so in John chapter 13, we see Jesus sharing a meal, community, washing the feet of these disciples of his, serving them. And here's what we read in John 13. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, he was returning to God. Jesus knew who he was. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Here's Jesus at this table sharing a meal. At that meal he broke the bread, he poured out the cup and he said, my body will be broken for you, my blood will be shed for you. At that meal he washed their feet. And you know who he shared a meal with? You know who, who he served do you know who he washed the feet of? Peter, who would deny him a short time later. I don't know, Jesus. I swear, I don't know, Jesus. May I be cursed if I know him? I don't know the man. That Peter, he washes his feet. Judas, who would betray him. And Jesus knew he was gonna betray him. He washed his feet. Thomas, who would doubt him. He washed Thomas's feet. And all the disciples would run away. In Jesus' greatest moment of need, every one of them would run for the hills. And he washed their feet. Jesus knew the frailty of human beings. And he still entered community with them. If we're gonna become more like Jesus, we better be ready to take those steps into community, even when it's scary, even when we've been hurt. And I'm not saying, you know, walk back into an abusive relationship. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about normal church life where, where you've been hurt, someone's done something unkind, and you start to step back, step back. And today's the day that God might just say to you, take that step forward. So here's my question. What are some next steps into consistent community? What are some, what are some steps that, that each one of us could look and say, maybe I can take a next step to be involved in community that connects me with God's people? Here's a few ideas. Stop, look around, say hi, and chat. The service ends, out to the car. Or stop, look around, hi. I, but I know you, but I, I haven't had a chance to meet you. I, I'm so-and-so. It's, it's nice to meet you. I'm not sure. And, and just, you can do that. You can just, just say hi to someone. Give it a shot. See what happens. You'll probably end up with a conversation, maybe make a new friend. Ask a good question. Uh, on the Shoreline app, if you open up the Shoreline app, the very first thing, if you click on it, there's 10 great questions you can ask someone after a church service or any time. If you're like, well, I don't know what to ask anybody. You got 10 of them now. Say, excuse me, hi, I haven't met you. Let me check my app. I'm going to ask you question number three. Um, <laughs> but you could probably be a little smoother than that. But you get the point, right? I mean, just, just ask a question. Talk with somebody. Serving side by side with people. You want to build community? Jump in the hospitality team. You'll have a great group of friends immediately. You want to build community? In the, in the bulletin, there's this little card, Shoreline Kids, Volunteers Needed. I think if we had 50 to 70 new volunteers right now, we'd probably still need a couple more volunteers with our kids' ministry. And some of you, some of you, your step today is going to be this. You're going to say, I'm going to fill out this card. Here's my little step. Fill out this card. Go through the lobby, down the stairs, the first Tent on the left, that's the kid's tent. And just hand it to him. If you don't want to go over there, fill this out and give it to an usher on your way out and say, can you turn this in for me to the kid's, the kid's booth? And if you get involved in kid's ministry, here's, you get community on two levels. This is, this is a double bonus. Number one, community with the other leaders of kids. But also you create a place for kids to have community and you build friendships with little kids who come running up to you when they see you at church and they say, hi, to you. And you get, you're part of the community of the church at a different level. If that, and and you, some of you would say, man, I come to second service, I could... I could just stay the third service and help out. Or I could come the first service and help out. I could do it every week. Some of you go, I could do it once a month. Whatever you can do, fill it out, drop this off, and let's, let's create community for our kids and for each other as we connect in children's ministry. A great place to connect. Um, join a community group. We actually have groups at Shoreline called community groups. It's groups that hang out and do things that they all enjoy. So we have, listen to this, we have a basketball community group, a hiking group, a scuba group, 
board games group, handyman, repair things for people, woman's book club. On the website, there's always already a list of all the books they're going to do this year. You go, that sounds like fun. There it is. Go online, check it out, learn about the community groups. Jump into a small group. Small groups gather around God's word, but they have great relational time. Some of the small groups meet weekly, some meet every other week, some meet once a month. But jump into a small group, a great place. There's a booth for small groups. There's a group booth for community groups out in the courtyard today. Go check those out. And now the lightning round. I'll give you a bunch of more quick, quick little ones, okay? Um, classes in the bulletin, Wednesday night classes. They start this Wednesday night. You, you can go to a class, connect with people, get to know them around the word of God and around spiritual learning. And so check out the classes. There's a booth for that out there. Invite someone over to your house. Just invite somebody over. I had somebody recently say, hey, do you want to come over? Uh, and actually, Saturday night, yesterday. They said, we're going to have tacos, just kind of have time with friends and watch some football. And I said, you had me at tacos. Um, and, so, and so last night I had tacos and I hung out with friends and watched some football. And it was, it was great community. Just hang out with people. Spend time with people. Alpha, a new ministry starting here at Shore. This is one of our newest ministries. Uh, there's a booth for Alpha out there. Just if you go to the donuts and turn left, you'll find the Alpha booth. And uh, this starts this Thursday. And, this, and this, is, this is a group that gathers around a meal, around a learning time, and around a time of conversation about things of faith. And especially for those that want to learn more about Jesus, grow in their faith as a new believer or a young believer, or invite, walk, come with somebody who wants to learn more about Jesus. If you know someone that doesn't know Jesus, and you might want to invite them to Alpha, you can either invite them this Thursday, or you come Thursday, see what it's like, and I'm pretty sure by the next week you'll be inviting him to come. Because you go, man, this is great. This is community, a meal, learning, answering questions in a safe environment. We have a divorce care and a grief share ministry. Community with people that are walking through the same loss in terms, in, in terms of uh, divorce or in terms of grief. Our grief share uh, new group is starting Tuesday night this week. And if you're in a time of, of kind of loss and sorrow, check that out. There's a booth for that. Just go to the donuts, turn left. It's right there. Uh, there's a group that's going to be going to uh, Greece and the surrounding area in Greece uh, for an 11-day trip called the Footsteps of John and Paul and following some of the biblical characters and their journey around that part of the world. And it's all free as long as you pay the money to go. Um, and so, but if that would be fun for you, if you can, man, I'd love to go to Greece with a bunch of Christians, learn and, and hear the biblical storyline through that trip. It's going to be an amazing time. And they go for 11 days. That group becomes a community. And they come back with new friends that probably last for a lifetime. And so that's an option. Uh, Bible studies. We have men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies, couples Bible studies, morning Bible studies, evening Bible studies, middle of the day Bible studies. Take a step in if, you, if you're willing to do that. And I'm going to give one last encouragement. Okay, I'm gonna look right here at the camera. And I'm gonna say, if you're at home right now and you're following Shoreline Church online and you live in Monterey and you're not coming here to the building because you, somebody hurt you or you take a step back or it's just more convenient, I'm gonna say, we welcome you to join us next week. Everybody say, welcome. welcome. Nicely done. That was very warm, warm hearted. So come join us here and maybe you've distanced from people, but come. And, and I just wanna finish by saying, I know, I know what it is to be hurt by someone in the church. I've had my fair share of those moments. I also know what it is to experience the love and the joy of community. I know that we is greater than just me. And we're made to be in community with each other. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today. That each one of us will take one more step forward in community. That if we've been hurt by someone in the church, and Lord, I think we all have been, that we would not distance from the church because of one person's behaviors, but that we would be not only willing to build community with other people, but we would become that community that others would feel loved and embraced and cared for. I pray that Sherry and I could be like Walt and Patty were to us when we were a young couple, how they loved us and cared for us and reached out to us. Could we create a community here that's compelling, that the world looks and says, oh, they love each other. They're imperfect, they have struggles, but they love each other in the name of Jesus. Help us grow in community and to know that we is greater than just me alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.